Welcome to Paths to Understanding podcast with wisdom from our neighborhood with members of the Anacortis Anti-Racism Cooperative. At Paths to Understanding, our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. As we begin, we want to acknowledge that all of us are currently standing on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Coast Salish peoples themselves and pledge to work for our common future. Um, so today we're going to begin a little bit differently um, with the uh, some of the members of the group introducing the group to all of us and then sharing a little bit about the resources that they've put together and how we can all access those. My name is Will and we are the Anacortes Anti-Racism Cooperative. Um, we are an intergenerational group of community organizers, researchers, artists, parents, educators, healthcare providers, construction workers, and business owners, and many more things who live and work in Anacortes. Um, we came together in the summer of 2020 in solidarity with the Movement for Black Lives. And during this time, we realized that there was a need for action, not just in larger cities around the world, but in small towns like ours as well. Um, we heeded the call, formed a group chat, and began having meetings at Cosmoland Park in town. And from meeting in the streets, we moved virtually to city council meetings, responding to policing issues and needs for social services within the city. And for the past year, we have also worked in collaboration with community groups to develop a research project about the history of racism in Anacortes. Um, our collective has shape shifted through many compositions, growing and shrinking in size and adapting structure through the seasons and stages of COVID. As a group of predominantly white folks, we acknowledge that we are complicit and benefit from the harmful structures of power that are rooted in racism and classism. We hope our collective work can meet people where they are to encourage self-reflection and growth, especially in regards to their relationship with white supremacy as it manifests in their community. Uh, Will mentioned the uh, history uh, project that we've been working on, which is a zine um, that comes in a lot of different forms. It's called Recorded Acts of Racism. Here's a hard copy, you can pick it up. In some businesses in downtown Anacortes, we can include um, the names of some of them where you can get them, also at the library. Um, you can also access it online. Um, so there's a PDF that anybody can look through. And we also have, um, a Google Doc that includes all of the hyperlinks to this resource. We really wanted um, all of these little moments and time for people to potentially do deeper dives into um, through discovering the original resource. And one incredible resource has been the digitization of the Anacortes American. Um, and so one example um, if you click on this, the Google Doc, you can, for example, for um, the 22nd of July, uh, 1915, it goes more into a history of um, a group of uh, a mob of 300 men who packed the council chambers um, demanding the removal of Japanese laborers. And this story, this article goes into great depth of, of that um, conversation and the, what occurred that evening. So that's just one example. So all of this research really came through um, hours of um, doing keyword searches um, amongst our group members, amongst other community members. Um, we also reached out to the um, Samish Indian Nation to um, double check any stories um, that connected to their history. A lot of it comes directly from their website, from their timeline, an incredible resource. And also um, some of the stories come from the Skagit Historical Museum. So really lots of different resources that people can do deeper dives into. Thank you so much, Kate and Will. And, and so I want to begin our conversation with just how did this thing get started and what was kind of motivating you all uh, to start this project together? As far as like the early days of this project goes and where a lot of the um, reason to do it 
came from is just from an something that we the collective of us were hearing a lot from other community members in town and just sort of a general idea that there is in Anacortes, which is a small majority white town um, that, you know, we live up here in the Northwest and um, racism doesn't really happen here in our town. Our town is a town of good people who take care of each other. And we're not like those guys down South or anything like that. We don't have a history of that here. And we don't do that here anymore, especially. Um, and just the continuing feeling that that is so wrong that despite how um, idyllic a community like ours can look on the surface level um, as people who live in it, it's very clear that it's not actually what it is or what many people want to believe that it is. Um, and just even in the fact that Anacortes is a town that is majority white and very much so felt just like proof enough that of course racism is in this town and it's baked into the very being of what this town is and who um, and, and what our history is for sure. And so it was just about like this general idea of being so existent in the community that that's not us, we're not like that. And they're not really being a lot of um, foundation to combat that argument in terms of research. We found out was that um, Anacortes used to be diverse. We used to have a cannery here and we had Croatian Americans working side by side with Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans and others. And we don't have that now. And so isn't that curious? And so looking at the history as to why that would be is really helpful. And it's in the timeline in the zine too. So I'm curious, uh, you know, I know this is kind of a, a question that could be at the end, but I think it's it's important to ask it at the beginning. Um, how did you all grow as persons and, and as a group as you did the project together? I feel like throughout the construction of this timeline, which has been a very long and arduous process at times. Um, there was a lot of, I guess, reflection on what is not known or what I don't know, um, or what others in the community might not know. But from a personal angle, like, what do I not know about what's come before me and the people that have come before me, whether they be um, white ancestors or um, Japanese American ancestors as well. Um, and just like, I guess I started to feel like there's so much about the history of anything that is completely lost. And there's so much about how people used to be and about our understanding of who people used to be that is lost and to have gone through that process of digging up all of this stuff that really has never been dug up before in our community in a notable way really made that clear to me that um, just how much knowledge and how much of who we are is forgotten, whether that be intentionally or unintentionally. And I guess that felt fairly affecting to my own idea of not only what our community is, but um, what the past and the history of America and people in general is as well, and what's been forgotten often intentionally. What Will is saying is such a uh, important point in that with this research, what we're finding were the recorded moments um, of, <laughs> I mean, who could even guess what that percentage is then of these recorded moments. And not only are they only the recorded moments, they're being told from a very particular perspective a lot of the time. And so there's a lot of sifting um, to go through when, when reading this material that um, especially the older it is, the more violent it feels. Um, 
And so we have that hindsight that allows us to kind of draw a line a little bit more um, that then as we get closer and closer to our current moment, I think that's where some people start to feel like, oh, well, this wasn't an act of racism necessarily. <laughs> um, so I think what, one thing that was an interesting part of our discussion, <laughs> my cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that was an interesting part of our discussion was about um, how to deal with the fact that, that, that we, as a predominantly white group who are compiling these stories, how do we treat some of this really um, violent language that's incorporated that in the moment was just cultural expression. Um, so um, we decided after many conversations um, to keep the language as it was first presented um in the same way that our yeah our goal is really just to present material even if it's painful um and to to provide um conversation for other people to interpret from that as compared to putting like an already an editorial layer of oh this is too this is too much we need to change this tone somehow um, but that was a really interesting conversation that we had about that, which also part of it had to do with well, what does that mean with it being a predominantly white group making that decision? How does it feel for a person of color to be reading some of this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Kate, we were talking also about legacy as well, and that we wanted to um, really make sure that we're being mindful and good um, advocates and historians and um, researchers for those who come after us, that they get the material as it is. Um, it reminds me of when I looked up my um, ancestors, I have, I'm, I'm part Croatian and I looked them up and the language that they talked about sex what I didn't even know what they were talking about because they couldn't use the words that we normally we use today and it's no big deal but then it was like you know I, I had to kind of read between the lines and figure out was historically how they would talk about things in order to know the actual story so the less work that someone has to do in the future the better the different uh, racist names for people's was a long discussion and a, a deep discussion. And those are the kinds of things we came up with and we didn't always agree, but we developed this trust and safety net. I don't really know how that happened. I was thinking about that earlier tonight, but we would put things out on the line and language. We talked a lot about language and uh, Language is important, words have meaning. And we went round and round and round. And that was a really interesting night. And we had several nights like that. We would study online, Zoom. And when Kate and Will mentioned the American, you know, we would find these articles and talk about them. And yet next to it would be some other thing that was also very sociological interesting to us in the time. So I guess we weren't just confined to these things, but we've tried to focus on them. Thank you so much, Patty, and, and everyone else who shared here. So I've, I've asked the group if each one of them would, would uh, uh, share one incident of racism in Anacortes uh, that they've uncovered here and, and share what it means to them. Okay, I was just gonna say that one of the incidents that um, just really hit me were um, in June 14th, 1900, or uh, January 14th, 1906, that a mob of 100 men demand the immediate removal of the Japanese mill laborers and block the passenger ship from arriving with additional laborers. And um, Anna Cordes American 
um, report that um, they, people want a new train depot so that 5,000 ladies of Anacortes don't have to mingle in a small hole in the wall with a hobo Chinaman, Jab, Siwash, Greaser, and um, I don't know. Anyways, these are just incredibly disgusting to me and so important to highlight that that was not even that long ago here in this community. And our whole community is based on our fishing industry and uh, we've stolen this land from the, the Native Americans and then made people come here and work here and then didn't want people to work here. And it was just... One that really hits me is the one that's the most, one of the most recent, which is, um, you know, in our small town, it's, I don't, it's, you know, 2021, November 1st right now. So tomorrow is the deadline of the elections. And we have two mayoral candidates who have been on city council and who were there during the uh, proclamation of, in of inclusion for our town. And one of these mayoral candidates, and he was the only one that um, did not vote for it and uh, made some uh, proclamations as to, you know, you know, sir, sir, you know there's, it's, in the, it's in the magazine, but it was just very interesting to me that um, this person who is not interested in inclusion in the town as far as how it was presented in that way um, is now one of our mayoral candidates. And I find that to be very interesting and upsetting that the things that we're talking about in history, it's not in the past. It's still playing out today. And I find a lot of folks that are, um, uh, you know, have white privilege, such as myself, um, have the benefit of not seeing that if we don't want to. But it's very true. It's very real. And if you take a minute to look, you'll see how, how much things are still playing out. For me, of like of all of these uh, entries in the timeline, the first one really just hits it for me. Um, so I'll read it. It's February 8th, 1853. Washington Territory is established. The Appropriation Act of 1850 authorizes the President of the United States to negotiate, negotiate, with Indian tribes to extinguish title to their land so that citizens of the U United States can colonize these lands. It's just like, that's the beginning of this timeline, which we've already said is merely like what's recorded. And so that first point for me is just like, what, what did this place look like before? right and like who was here um and what was their relationship to the land here and like what's not told again will was talking about this too like um just reflecting on whether it's a forgotten history or purposely not included or taken away right from folks i'd like to add to that that um like from what juliet was saying that what we have in this book, like, um, you know, if you were to stretch out your arms, your fingernail would be that pre this, these acts in comparison to the presence of the Samish Indian nation on this land. And um, I, I know I already mentioned it, but their timeline <laughs> goes into a lot more depth of that richness of that culture and that of course is thriving to this very day. Um, and uh, for me, what, and one thing, or it's actually two points because it talks about um, kind of the scope of, uh, we have October of 1898 or 1900 where a local woman creates and stages a play in Anacortes and one of the actresses performs in blackface and then in 1964, um, though there were probably more recent events after that, we have an example 
of a man and woman dressing in blackface as street sweepers for a 4th of July parade on Guaymas Island. And it's just interesting because we go from 1898 to 1964. It's almost a full century. <laughs> um, and like what Patty was saying, you know, these are newspaper articles. So right alongside <clears throat> those events, we have ads for cigarettes, we have ads for ham, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just the banality of it, um, I think is what helps situate all of these events that we could very, that we do want to isolate because there's so much shame surrounding them. Um, but really, it's just people having parades and parties and going to school and going to the grocery store <laughs> that these events occur. And of course, the ones that get reported on are the parades and the plays. Um, but I think um, seeing that legacy, um, like Anastasia was talking about, of almost this, this full century <laughs> of blackface in Anacortes, um, that it's really, it's, it's a cultural form um, that we understand is, is, is connected to the enslavement <laughs> of African-Americans um, that then expresses itself in these local plays. Um, and so for me, seeing it filter into, you know, this full century of cultural expression in the town um, stood out to me. In uh, 1926, the KKK quote, made, their, made Anacortes their Mecca, hosting a gala for hundreds of KKK members at the Whitney School. And then in July 24th, 2019, a noose is hanging, found over Capsante Overlook. Uh, Mayor Gear calls it a very threatening symbol that does not reflect Anacort the Anacortes I know. But what Kate was saying is that still, you know, I mean, I feel like that's still... Uh, the past hundred years and it's still very relevant to now and this stuff is still continuing in our community and we keep on people keep pretending that it's not happening but there are just clear clear threats and clear acts of intimidation and uh just like uh just completely making it normal so nobody thinks that it's like it's cultural like you were saying so i find that um very important that this is still continuing. May 1891. Um, the first mayor of Anacortes is elected. His name is Frank B. Hogan, and he's a former Confederate captain. So the first mayor of Anacortes was actually a Confederate. And I mean, you know, it reminds me of a year or so back when there was quite a lot of discussion down south about what are we doing, uh, having monuments up to Robert E. Lee and other uh, prominent Confederate um, figures and whatnot. And that was a big discussion down there. And yet again, up here in the Northwest, we're not like that, that doesn't happen here. And for such an important historic figure in Anacortes, the first mayor, somebody who in fact is memorialized outside of city hall um in a mural right outside of like right, right when you're walking in the doors you get to see a former confederate captain and <laughs> for that one to be the case and for that also i don't think to be known very well i don't think anybody thinks that because who knows the um who the mayor of anacortes was or who, or who the first mayor of anacortes was or who the first mayor of any small town was really and so you know when we're thinking a lot about like what's our history that we have to grapple with as a country it's very easy to go to the larger um figures in american history that represent that past racism whether it be prominent confederate generals but in small communities too there is this legacy and i don't think that legacy is as easy to unpack or unravel because it's simply not a legacy that perhaps even matters to many people enough for them to know about it in the first place or to look it up. So that was just something that was surprising for me to find out um, and surprising for me to realize that like, I don't think 99% of people who live in Anacortes would know that <laughs> to begin with. Along with Rochelle mentioning the KKK, we actually have three 
citations about KKK events in Anacortes or involving people from Anacortes in the 1920s. And I guess I sort of thought of the KKK as a much more Southern entity. And it was very eye-opening to see these things here. And then also, uh, did we talk about the Whidbey thing? You know, years later, we had a thing in Whidbey, which was essentially a white supremacy uh, coalition. And, and we haven't lost our prejudices, I don't think. I also have an Asian friend who went through it and said that his grandparents could have been on those boats that were sent away or people were thrown off. So it it is, you know, in addition to all the Native American stories, we have so many stories in this little zine. And this is only a drop in the bucket. So when, again, like where Mayor Garris said, this is not the Anacortes that I know. I've only lived in Anacortes a few years. I mean, a couple years now. And to me, this is the Anacortes that I know. I moved here when it was during COVID and everything. And I just keep on seeing more and more acts of aggression and racism and people not being tolerated or treating, treated equally over and over in this community. And it's so important for me to try to do something to make a difference because it's unacceptable what we're doing here. But I, to me, that, that, that is the Anacortes that I know. And I find that very disheartening, but also so glad that we're all, all of us, everybody who's doing good things, Terry, every kind of group and organization here that you know we're trying to like shine the light on the atrocities and how to move forward and how to make ourselves a more inclusive and better community as well. Thank you, Rochelle. And I, I just want to say for a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll break out of the moderator role for a minute. And, you know, I, I, I was, um, I was my first response in looking at this, uh, at these recorded acts was how many of them I had not heard of before. It was just it was just kind of amazing. I mean, when you all showed me the first draft, I was blown away by that. And uh, but I, I I think, you know, one of the ones one of the events that, you know, that I was among those who experienced, you know, happened on May 30th of 2020 when a man drove down 12th and Commercial Avenue and 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 continued to smash into uh, into uh, people, into human beings. Um, and that was right after another person came through the intersection and and uh, actually ran over part of my foot. And uh, what was really shocking to me um, about that entire scenario, um, and yet it shouldn't have been, was that the city prosecutor chose not to prosecute those people with the with the cover that that, quote, lots of people made mistakes that day, unquote. Uh, talking about the protesters who occupied the intersection for five minutes, not 50 minutes, not five hours, but five minutes, and comparing that a kind of protest, which is a, a very, um, you know, a, supposedly a very American kind of thing to honor, right? Supposedly, um, with people who used, you know, multiple thousand pound vehicles to intimidate and harm and hit people. And uh, and so I, I was, you know, it's it's actually, you know, still uh, producing some harm in my soul that the prosecutor in town chose not to prosecute the people who use their vehicles as weapons. One of the other things that they that that that, that, that were, was said to me uh, about about that was, well, nobody got up in the morning deciding they were going to run over protesters. And my response to that is to that was that is precisely wrong. There are there are meme there were memes on Facebook at the time. Uh, there were all kinds of messages from hate groups of various kinds and all kinds of media 
saying that it was okay to use cars as tools of weapons, as tools of intimidation, and as weapons against people who were protesting in favor of law and order, of, of, a, of a kind of rule of law. Because that's what the Black Lives Matter protests were. They were a protest for the law to actually be followed in a way, and then the law also to be changed to, to live out uh, the aspirational constitutional values of the country and human rights for everyone. So I, I continue, you know, still a, a year and a half later to feel um, a, really betrayed, I think, by the prosecutor uh, in town um, who, who never reached out uh, to me or as far as I know, anyone else uh, before he made his decision to keep it quiet. And if that event was kept quiet, how many other events, as you all have said, never made a headline? And I can think of other events in the last year or so that have not made headlines either, uh, just as Rochelle said, and as many of you have experienced. So that really is a, a challenging piece for me. So I think it'd be really important at this point to ask why these stories have not been fully told. Um, why it is, this is not the Anacortes we remember. Like, why do you think that is, y'all? That's, that's a good question, Terry, isn't it? I mean, you know, how crazy making is it to be in a community that says we're all nice people and this doesn't happen here and yet it does and it gets covered up or not acknowledged or you know prosec you know the laws aren't followed you know things like that it's it's absolutely crazy making in the in the full use of that word i i wonder if we have a some kind of um communal illness, much like trauma, we don't want to acknowledge things because they're painful. But if anyone has done any kind of work with trauma, you know that we have to start with um, coming back to yourself, coming back to self, being embodied, and then having that capacity to sit in discomfort you know, so that you can, as we've talked about yesterday, you lance the boil or whatever the thing is and let sun and air get into that secret, dark, festering place so that the whole organism can heal. And I feel that way with, with communities as well. So we, we, we do that, we wall off so that we don't have to feel because it's really overwhelming when we realize how hurtful humans can be to other people. I totally second that. Um, and I think also a big reason why, you know, there's not a lot of these stories that are reported is to like, I think it's important to look at who's telling the, who's telling the story, who has access to the, tools to language to be reporting to education to be reporting things um and who's here to begin with and who's not here anymore so i guess what i'm saying is it's like it's a structural issue right it's a there's a like who again who's telling the stories about who and why and it's all built into the structure that is rooted in genocide and white supremacy and Along with that, there is this collective amnesia, right, of the harm that has been done um, that does need to be reckoned with to move forward, um, or not necessarily forward, but in whatever direction it is. It could be up, down, zigzaggy, inside, outside. Um, but yeah, just structurally, I think to acknowledge that this is just like, you know, people are like, that, these things don't happen here. It's like, yeah, why not? Like, we have to go all the way back to figure out why these things don't happen here or you don't think they happen here because you, you haven't heard of anything happening. Who are your friends? What is your community? What do you read? What do you listen to? Where do you walk around? Where did you learn um, 
how to be a person. And you know what I mean? Who did you grow up around? What did they look like? What language did they speak? Where are they from? Do you know where your ancestors are from? How did they relate to this or that? Um, I don't know. That's just, it's such a big question, such a good question. And I feel like it go, it can go to so many different um, reasonings that are all very much connected as well and intersectional, right? I think it's just an incredibly hard thing as people and especially as people who live up here culturally maybe to um, one, admit that you were wrong <laughs> and two, just sort of like actually accept that into um, into yourself, whether you're admitting that you yourself are wrong or whether that you're admitting that there is or was a sickness in your community. It's, I mean, it's a very like existential thing at the end of the day. Like I've been living my life this one way forever. And so to say that that was wrong, that I was doing something wrong or that I, especially that I am continuing to do something wrong. It seems like it would be an easy thing to do, but I think a lot of times it's not that people are choosing not to accept that, but that there's literally a mental block in some ways from them accepting that at all. They, they're they subconsciously pushing it away. I mean, to speak from my own experience, I remember, because I grew up in Anacortes and I'm a, um, mixed race, young, at the time in the closet queer kid. And I'm growing up around a bunch of white kids and everybody's racist. And it's just like a thing. And everybody's racist to me. Everybody's racist to everybody else. And eventually like I become like that too, for whatever reason. But I didn't even realize for so many years that like I, I I could recognize what I was doing and I could recognize like that um I was saying things or acting in a way that was racist but it wasn't something that like my mind could actually process it didn't feel like that to me especially because everybody around me didn't take it like that or didn't think of it like that because everybody was white people around me and so you know, I would talk with my friends and we would make racially based jokes amongst each other, often at me, but um, <laughs> to other ethnicities as well. And then in the same conversation, we'd be like, yeah, and you know, it's really great that we've got a black president now. It's just something that's not even in your mind or it's something that your mind can't like accept about itself. It doesn't make sense to you. So it really is an existential thing and it really is something that I don't think people are purposefully doing it's just something that like it how could I ever accept that there's something wrong with me to that level especially something that's so that's seen as so evil in the year 2021 um it's just a really hard thing to accept especially for a community at large we were discussing that yesterday is that um people um, have this cognitive dissonance between like saying that this is racism is evil and we're not evil we're good people and this is bad and this doesn't happen anymore and I don't want to admit that I'm part of this or anything like that because I'm a good person I'm not evil I mean I'm not quite sure what that is but that's such a great point Will thank you so much for um, sharing your experience and bringing that up as well Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, Kate, I, I saw you were getting ready to talk. Yeah, I mean, connected to what you all are saying, I mean, just thinking back actually to how we all started working together, literally when the first protests were occurring in Seattle, I remember thinking like, okay, I guess I'm gonna drive the hour and a half to Seattle. And then our friend, Nick Rennes, said, hey, he just sent a group text, hey, I'm going to be on the corner of Fulton commercial. And even that programming in my head that was like, oh, I need to go to an urban location to participate 
and this type of action <laughs> speaks to that type of um, attitude that I have about the place that I have chosen to live in. <laughs> um, and so I think that um, we all have an understanding of what, of what racism means, um, but partially due to just how stories are told and, what's, and which ones get emphasized or reported on because of the resources that are available, we hear more about these acts when they are centered in urban places. Um, or when it's happening in the South, when we see images of burning crosses, when there's a kind of like drama associated with it that doesn't necessarily take place in the same ways in the present day of our town and the school hallways. Um, and so I do think that part of it too is just practical in that um, it took for this project, all of us <laughs> working on this, you know, for, an hour at least once a week for a full year. And two of us um, are, have been employed or currently employed at the Anacortes Museum. So we knew about these resources that were available to do this research. However, I somehow grew up in this town not knowing that it was founded by a Confederate mayor, not knowing that the KKK was going to the Whitney School. Um, and, and, and all the while, um, these kinds of jokes are, are happening and I'm participating in, in my school, like Will is talking about. And so I think part of it has to do with how are we able to even learn this? If we do uh, live in rural areas, how do we have access to this? Because people are interested. It's just literally, I think, particularly in our town, when we have all these murals, there's this kind of feeling of like, oh, look at all of those old, boring, historic people. They must have all been good <laughs> and end of story. I don't know. I think, so I think there's kind of a um, veneer about, um, about how we can, how we relate to the sort of Euro-American immigration story to this area that allows us to continue in a way sleepwalking in the comfort of this beautiful rural location um, that in cities, there's a little bit more of that tension. I think there's a, maybe a little bit more of that dialogue, the understanding that public spaces can be places for protest and that there's that opportunity for conversation. There's resources for that. But we have it here, obviously. And so thank you, Terry, for <laughs> being part of the facilitation of that. Well, thank you, Kate, and and thanks to all of you. I mean, I, I am so, you know, humbled by this work that you've taken on, you know, every single week and then many hours, you know, beyond that. And just that shift of imagination from like, well, hey, let's go down to Seattle because that's where the issues are, right? That shift of imagination, that, that, that the kind of leadership that came from an entire group of people, right? All of you showed leadership in various ways to create those protests on 12th and commercial. And I just, I also want to say that, you know, you all showed great leadership and there are lots of other adults in the community that like, like follow, that, that followed your leadership on that too. And I, I want to thank them too and, and give a shout out to them for showing up, you know, for, for so many Sundays and Saturdays and, and for marches, you know, and I, and I, and I, I just want to, like, I, I think about myself, my own life, you know, um, it was, it took me a long time to realize that my family got its start uh, in Washington state on land that was stolen forcibly under duress and threat from the Palouse people. And I remember as a little kid asking the, my fourth grade teacher, like, as we're covering a quote unquote American history, unquote, you know, <laughs> And and I remember saying to her, well, what happened, you know, what happened to the Indians? I, that was what I said. And I think she said they went away. And I knew she was lying. I felt a, a pain in my stomach when she said that to me. And yet uh, it, it took it took a long time to recognize that we want to think well of ourselves. And we're willing to deny almost anything 
to continue to think well of ourselves, forgetting the, the, our capacity to learn and change and grow and be forgiven, right, for things that we've benefited from over time and work for restitution and work to make things right. Like that is also a part of the human experience. But we deny a lot of things in order to feel good about ourselves. And so I, you know, I wonder, like, what do you all hope the community will do differently? Uh, what kind of work are you hoping the community will do um, as the result of your work? I hope that in the case of the zine and whose ever hands it falls into, um, and if they're specifically in this community in Anacortes or maybe other places, um, that it can serve as like a, a seed, seed planting. I don't think, you know, it's not like you're gonna read this and suddenly you figured out how to be anti-racist and you know what I mean? Like this isn't all that it is. It's not just this zine, um, but I hope that they can like plant seeds for folks to, you know, start to like step into their, to their guts a little bit and just be like, oh, like, what am I feeling when I read this scene? Am I feeling uncomfortable? Um, and to get curious about it. And I hope that they have support in some way to do that, whether if it's by themselves or with, you know, someone who loves them um, to be like, what is this? mean for me um and hopefully it plants a seed and they can you know do their own research ask for help when appropriate um there's so much information about like history we have the internet there's so much information that we all have access to um so i don't know to meet people where they're at and hope hope for some like reflection um and also self-compassion too right we've been talking about how it's really it's scary to be like I, I was wrong this whole time or I'm bad now it's like no you're not bad or good which is another what I think what I believe is another white supremacist notion is that you're good or bad you're evil or good um and also like the obsession with perfectionism and being right I think that is all a symptom of the powers that be, which are rooted in white supremacy. And yeah, seed planting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to piggyback on that, Jules, because um, I would love to create a new culture that um, hearkens to the culture that we all really want anyway, which is a sense of belonging, acceptance, and including all of us, that we become stronger together. But in the in that context of dismantling white supremacy, and and that that we as white people, those of us who are white, acknowledge that there is a white culture that we did not sign up for, and that we can choose to not do it anymore, and that we can create a culture in which we can be wrong together and celebrate it and go, we found it. Okay, that's where that is. And pull that weed out and start and start having a stronger, healthier um, Anacortes culture. Yeah. yeah, in like regards to that whole conversation, I think, you know, as important as what can the community do is simply um, what, kind of community can exist. I know something that we were talking about um, in terms of like how the group had come together and how we'd formed as a collective is that before we'd formed here, it was, <laughs> there was a feeling that there was nowhere else to really, there was nowhere to go in town to talk about things like this or to do activist work in this way. And so I think just as important as like what can community members do is just the building of that kind of um, anti-racist and progressive community that is willing to have discussion and is willing to actually work on the great sicknesses that exist in our town locally, not just the sicknesses that exist nationwide, not just the ones that exist down in Seattle, but 
the kinds of things that are wrong with us as people from Anacortes. So I think the building of that community and a, the building of a community that can exist um, and do good work is one of the most important things in my head. All politics is local. And so, you know, we have to hope that change is local and that small change can make a difference. And so we have to have these conversations among our friends, among our peers, um, in our town. That, that's just something I'm hoping from this. Um, I'll just add to that um, from what you all were saying. I, um, this project, yeah, I've been thinking of it as an act of intimacy as a way to feel closer to living here. Um, that there, for me personally, there's like a great feeling of discomfort of just going to the store, you know, going on a hike and then looking to Seattle or something, you know, for that type of conversation, like Will was saying. Um, and, and the thing that I think is amazing in Anacortes and that is special, and of course can be found elsewhere, there, is, there are people who want to participate. There's a responsiveness. Um, and, and there still are, are um, nothing will be met perfectly with, with what people may be asking for them, more support that's needed. But I do feel like in this town, in this community, there is possibility for change. There are people that do want to listen um, even just in our group, we have we have been able to participate in even in moving city money towards things that we believe in. And so and that was literally just from people meeting on the street corner. And so um, even reading these stories, as painful as they may be, when I walk by those locations, I feel more intimately connected to them. And that's how I want to live is where it's like, you look at a place, you look at a person, and it's just not one layer. There's a depth to it of time and of, of relations. And, and that's, there's so many different ways that people can do that. And that's what I hope um, a project like this could inspire other people to get involved in. It is painful. Um when we recognize that we've participated in, we've been shaped by, we've benefited from um, in, injustices and violence and theft of land and the enslavement of human beings. It is so painful. Um, but I think as we face that truth, um, as part of many, many truths, but, but as we face that, the truth of that, and we begin to recognize the humanity in other people and we begin to stand with each other. Um, I can't tell you how beautiful the, 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 the blessing and the healing is that comes from that. Um, so how can, can people still get involved with the ongoing work of your group and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and also participate in this conversation? Yeah. Yes, uh, contact any one of us and we'd love to have conversations and, you know, do fun things, do projects, whatever happens. There is no, there's no agenda. There's no, like, there's not a next step or a, or a strategic plan or anything. We're just wanting to continue, as Kate brilliantly talked about, creating that relationship and building that intimacy in our own town. We do have a, a Facebook page um, the one way <laughs> that we somewhat formalized <laughs> just the having that to share uh, when for other people to share when events are happening. And that's the Anacortes Anti-Racism Cooperative. So people can send messages to that too if they want to get involved in any way. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to thank each one of you for the, the, the time and, and the effort and the heart and also the leadership that you have shown in, in, in this project, but in so many others. And, and I, I just want you to know that it, it makes a difference and that there are many of us in the community that are willing to follow your leadership in all of this and are grateful for it. 
And I want to thank all of you for listening uh, tonight. And we want you to encourage you to check out the links that we'll have in the description, both in the podcast and on the YouTube channel. And you can find out, uh, see all of our uh, blogs and podcasts at pass2understanding.org, major podcasting services, and of course, our YouTube channel. And until we see you again, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors.